Susan Kelechi Watson plays Beth Pearson on the NBC drama This Is Us. I'm Denton Davidson for Gold Derby. Susan, like every year, the season has ended and people are losing their minds, trying to figure out what's going on. Is Beth okay? And can you share anything about what's going to happen in season six? Yeah, you know what? Beth is okay. She has made it. I, I, I made it to through season six. So that's <laughs> something that uh, I can say. And you know, when we last off, we, we left off, we see that Kate has, um, you know, she's about to get remarried. So that's, that's a big deal. We're five years ahead. And, um, you know, which is fun to play because we kind of aged up and, you know, everybody's a little bit older and things have changed. Um, but yeah, so far, so far, so good. Beth, Beth is, she's, she's in there. And it's tough to see a series end. Um, we know you're going out on season six, but is it good to be able to go out on your own terms and give closure to this family and the fans? Absolutely. I think there's something to knowing when you've told the story. And that has always been Dan's main goal is to tell the story of this family over these generations for this period of time. You know, we have spanned, I think we've even gone as far back as like early 1900s at one point. And, you know, we've just spanned generations and it was um, the, the goal of the show was to tell this family story authentically, to see where they came from, to try to find out where they're going, to watch the next generation come up. So we'll have the generation, you know, that is Deja and Tess and Annie and you know, um, and to see uh, all of that. And then to really get a sense of when it's time to stop telling that story. And, you know, the story stop started with Rebecca and Jack and, and it ends, you know, with Rebecca, I believe. So I, I think that, you know, it's a full circle moment. And also I know that Dan has had what the ending has been in his mind basically since season one. So it's always nice to know that we came, you know, we saw, we did the job that, you know, we wanted to do and we're going out on the note that, that we feel is best to go, to go out on. And it makes me more excited for this next season because I feel like it's gonna be so full. You know, it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, oh my gosh, like every episode is gonna be crazy because we now kind of get to leave it all on the stage, you know? And the show's been nominated for over 30 Emmys. The cast has won two Screen Actors Guild Awards for Best Ensemble. How special has that been to be part of something that's not only struck a chord with viewers, but your peers in the industry, they respect it so much as well. I, I tell you, that was so thrilling, man. I, I you know, I'm, I'm a big, like, it's great to be nominated person. Like, I, you know, like, I really mean that. That means so much. To win is like something you just don't, you, I don't know, that feeling was crazy. I just remember us knocking over chairs and things like that because we don't know how to act. But like, you know, to be to be recognized by your peers. I mean, I, I remember always saying to myself growing up, like the big awards for me, um, two of the biggest for me was SAG and, and the Tonys. And because I just knew that, they, you know, what went into choosing that was so much about like what your peers, um, you know, think. And so, um, it was such an honor to have that and to know that they were rocking with us and they were watching the show and and to feel that camaraderie that night of people who were like in our corner to get the, this award. Um, and also not for nothing, but we're probably the hardest audience to please as actors. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's not an easy crowd. So it, 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 it meant a lot that our show was um, touching them and that they, they appreciated the work that we were putting into it. Yeah, it was really, an amazing one. And then, you know, for it to happen twice was, was really dope. And the series has so many great storylines. Um, in season five, one of Beth's struggles is coming to terms with her daughter Tess being a lesbian, which she's really doing a great job at, but then she's faced with more things to learn as Tess starts dating a non-binary friend, Alex. More and more parents are facing this issue right now. What was it like to be part of that storyline? You know what, I really loved being one of the parents who kind of don't know what to do. Because I, I feel like we're in an age and stage right now where everybody wants to like get it right, right away so that everything stays kind of PC, nobody's feelings get hurt. You know, they say and do the right things.
But it was interesting to play Beth in a way for me where I felt like, what if she really does not know what to do? The only thing she's really concerned with is that her daughter doesn't feel like she's treating her differently because she's gay, you know? And so she's overdoing it at some times, underdoing it, she's gaining her trust, she's not getting her trust. And then you have this other element of like Tess becoming a teenager, you know, th this year, this season. So it was like, you know, the hormones are changing anyway, dynamics in parent child relationships are changing anyway. So the, that was already gonna be there. And then I have, you know, as Beth to check myself, like, am I giving her the same rules that I would give to Deja? Am I, you know, am I asking enough questions? Does it seem like I don't want to know because she's gay and I don't want her to think that, or there's just so many things. And so I just w wanted it to um, feel, I wanted to feel that rockiness. I wanted it to feel like where it normally, she would have disciplined her. She didn't because she kind of just didn't know how that would come off or, you know, there, there was just a space where Beth was unsure. And there's many times where Beth is sure, you know, it was very interesting to play her in this vulnerable space of not knowing how to handle it. And another thing Beth is going through is she's given up her corporate job and she opens this dance studio that is really upended by COVID-19. Um, she, even without the dance studio, kind of goes through this emotion of like, I still don't want to get back into this corporate job. As an mm -hmm. artist, I'm assuming there had to have been times that you related to Beth's struggle. Have you ever thought about what it would be like to give up your dream for a nine to five job and how, and how was that struggle pers persevering? You know, it was, it was a painful thing to, to feel like I had to give up my dream. Um, but the reality hit, like there was times when I was just unable to uh, just take care of my life, you know? And I couldn't, it's one thing to like pursue your thing, your dream and everything, it's another thing where it just becomes like crazy irresponsible, you know, and, I, and like, you just can't get by. And so you have to start thinking about other alternatives and it like slayed me, you know, because I'm just not that person and have, and I've never been, there's always been the artist in me, the one who, uh, you know, wants to create and you can feel that and you have to kind of kill that thing to try to do this other thing. So what I loved about Beth going through that was her taking the sign of like this Zoom meeting with this potential, um, you know, job nine to five as a sign of like, what, what, you know, what am I doing? Let me chill out for a second and figure myself out because it can be hard, you know, the life of an artist, why so many people are encouraged not to do it is because how it's so difficult and you never know what's going to happen. That's the reality of it. Um, and one of the very special things about playing um, playing the, the, a person who loses their business is that I was seeing that happen left and, and right, like beautiful small businesses. Let me tell you something, my nail shop, okay, uh, where I would get my powder nails done. It was called, yeah, powder. Yeah, I think it was like powder nails. Um, but anyway, I, they were thriving, like thriving black owned business on La Brea. Um, and just beautiful shop. They treated you so well. I loved going in there. I went in there every two weeks for my nails for This Is Us and um, Powder Nail Co. That was the name. And they, th like COVID wiped them out, you know? And so to see something that was successful, you know, just kind of have to go out like that. Uh, and that's just one example of somebody who was doing something, you know, fulfilling a dream of theirs. And so I was seeing that happen left and right. I'm seeing that all over Brooklyn. I'm seeing that all over LA, you know, and I just felt like it was so important to acknowledge the people who lost so much. They lost an investment. They lost their dream. They lost their family's livelihood um, all because of something that they had nothing to do with. They could never have predicted it, whether you were doing great or you were not doing so great or whether you were, you know, fledgling or whatever it was, you were, you know, um, we were all sort of like on the same playing field and leveled. I was happy to be able to try to represent that, that group of people because they really had my heart. Like I, I really, there's so many beautiful places that, you know, I drive by now and it's just, 
you know, it's empty. And I think about those people. I think about what, what they're doing. What, what are they doing now? The same way I thought about artists, the same way Broadway shut down. And, you know, as, as an artist and as coming from the theater, I was like, oh my God, what is my community doing? I know what it's like to live check to check, to have to rely on that check for health insurance. And we're in a pandemic and you ain't got no health insurance. Like right. it's just layer on layer, you know, all that stuff was there with me in, in, in playing that out and wanting to do a storyline like that because it was just worth acknowledging that there was so much loss on so many different levels. And it was great to see Beth sort of getting the support for once. She's always there for Randall. Um, we love the Pearson triplets, but they really are diving into the drama all of the time. And, and Beth's sort of a comic relief a lot of the times, I think. She's kind of like snapping them back into it, like, okay, get it together. Um, how has that working relationship with Sterling K. Brown developed over the, over the years? And what will you miss most about that? Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. That is going to come to an end, huh? We'll do something else. I'll just put that in my head so I don't get to. <laughs> um, you know, working with SK is, it's, um, it's a very sort of generous environment, you know, and um, an environment where I feel like we can play and nothing is off the table. And where he goes, I follow. Where I go, he follows. Um, and yeah, I, I, I don't know how often that comes around. I think I was, I was just very blessed to get that. Not that, you know, you don't get that in other acting relationships, but I think the fact is also that we're such good friends. And so we get, we got, we got both, you know, we got kind of the, the double crown there and, um, and became, you know, we've become such good friends in doing this. And, um, and so, yeah, so I, I feel fun. I feel free to play. I feel free to joke around. I joke around with him in real life. They give me a lot of funny stuff to do, you know, and a lot of lines that, you know, are funny and they let me play around with certain lines and, and things like that. And I love comedy. Like that's my favorite form of entertainment is comedy. And, and for me, so anytime I get a little comic bit, I'm, I'm all over it. And you also share the screen with the legendary Felicia Rashad as Beth's mother, Carol. What is acting opposite yeah. this American icon of television like? Oh, come on. Like legendary, I just want to say that that's, that, is, that is absolutely right. I think there's nobody who knows Felicia, knows her background from the Cosby show till now, who is not profoundly affected by what she's done on television and what she's done on stage. It stays with you. You hear the shout outs on social media. It's like she's the queen mother and, um, and it's so well deserved. And she's a she's been a mentor of mine. She's been a teacher of mine. So to be able to act alongside her, um, sometimes I can look in her eyes and see when she's like, you're getting it, you're getting it right. And that means a lot to me. <laughs> so, um, you know, to, to any time I, you know, I, ran, I, I pull Felicia, uh, Felicia into anything that I'm a part of, whether it's between the world and me, whether it's, you know, um, uh, this is, a, I didn't pull her into This Is Us, but, you know, she's a part of that world now too. And um, other stuff that that we do, we're just constantly like, uh, Felicia, do you want to do this uh, with us? And and she's she's always, she's there. And she brings her extraordinary talent and her extraordinary being and her extraordinary way of being. Um, and you both have strong area. connections to <clears throat> Howard University. Um, and speaking yeah. of Howard University, you narrate a piece within the HBO special Between the World and Me about Howard's significance to the African-American culture. It premiered last fall and you were the executive producer as well. Can you explain what this special means to you and how you got involved? Um, it means a lot to me. It, it came about during the pandemic um, and it happened right after Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and then George Floyd. And I was looking for a way to express, you know, I was thinking, should I write something that and ask, you know, my PR if there's a way that I can publish it? Should I do something on IG? You know, people were doing a lot of interviews and stuff like that. Should I, I didn't know what to do. And then one day I just was like, you know what? I don't know what to do. I'm like, God, if there's something that I should be doing, just let me know. 
And it's interesting that, we, you know, we had this game night um, with a group of friends and I, and it came up like um, doing a, a reading of, of, of Ta-Nehisi's play. And Camilla Forbes, who is the executive director at the Apollo Theater, a very good friend of mine and another executive producer on Between the World and Me, uh, had already staged this as a reading, um, you know, since 2018. And I had come on board, she'd asked me to come and do it then. And, you know, they've toured with it and things like that. And she had a plan to tour with it. And, um, and then I thought, what if we like reimagine this though for like streaming, for like um, the, 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 um, <clears throat> the screen so we can get it to like a really large audience because everybody's reading ta book right now because it's like ally ship reading, you know? Um, and then we just started brainstorming from there about how we can make this live on, on the screen and, and ta was totally on board. You know, we were just all on board with, with doing this. And, and we went from there, like we made a couple calls and, you know, um, we, we partnered with HBO and HBO Max who were incredible partners and were so, and so had our backs in doing this. And we were like one of the first productions, if not the first to go and film something. Cause it was literally in July of last year which was right smack dab you know, in the beginning, uh, in the middle of the beginning of the pandemic. And we were in the hotspot, we were in New York. So, um, so yeah, we, <laughs> but we felt it so strongly on us that we had to do something. And, and I don't think there was any better words than ta -Nehisi's. And 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 Camila who ha had worked with this script, you know, for many years before, uh, obviously felt the same way. And so, you know, we were able to, you know, come together and just make a, a beautiful piece with beautiful artists who were all a, a, an easy yes, they all felt the same way. And it's an incredible cast. I mean, there's too many people to even name and it's just so right. beautifully shot. The close-ups of the faces, the emotion is so strong. Um, I just thought it was really mo something moving to watch. Um, and you've clearly, been a force on screen, but you're also a stage actress and you're returning in The Merry Wives this summer in New York. The pandemic really just ruined and wreaked havoc on theater for so long. How meaningful is it for you to now get back on that stage and see all these talented artists get back to work? The crazy thing is I remember driving through Times Square and putting it on, on the gram when I did and just being like, oh my God, y'all, this is Times Square. What is going on? It was completely dead. I was the only car driving through there, a couple people walking around. And I was driving by like the August Wilson Theater and you know where Mean Girls was. And I was driving by, you know, um, the, uh, the wait, which one, which other, Studio 54, just all these different theaters. And everything was just silent. And I remember one of the people that I reached out to was Jocelyn Bio who is adapting Mary, uh, Mary Wives, Shakespeare's Mary Wives into the production that we're doing, which is based in Harlem, set in the Nigerian and Ghanaian community. And I remember hitting up Jocelyn being like, what is our community doing like right now? Because I've been in LA, I'm out of touch with what's going on in the theater, but I was so concerned. So for it to come full circle, like for her to be the person I reached out to and for her to be the one who's adapting this production and Sahim Ali, who's an associate artistic director at, at The Public is, is doing a brilliant job directing this thing. But to be like the first theater back and we're doing a comedy, <laughs> I'm like vibrating every day, like every day. <laughs> and then like, I don't even know, like, first of all, I can't believe I was doing this all the time. Like theater acting is a lot, you know? <laughs> you got to use your whole body, you know what I'm saying? And like all of yourself and your voice and your, you know, and it's comedy and I've, I'm working with some brilliant, brilliant actors. And I don't say that lightly, they're just so good. Um, so it means so much. Like I keep saying, like I, I did one of the first films to shoot during the pandemic. And then our show was one of the first to come back. And now I'm in the first theater production to come back. So this has been like, it was like the trifecta for me. Well, congratulations on all your work. Um, we are wishing you the best of luck this Emmy season. And we wanna encourage all of our viewers uh, to head over to goldderby.com, make your awards predictions and see more interviews with top contenders. Susan, thanks so much for talking with me today. Thank you, Denton. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Thank you.